This video is sponsored by Brilliant. As you are likely aware, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, and while the long-term solution to the coronavirus pandemic is likely a vaccine that can be deployed worldwide to the majority of the population, one of the short-term solutions is contact tracing. However, with the advent of contact tracing have come a lot of concerns about personal privacy. After all, a lot of the proposals have focused on recording the location and identity of every person who does or does not have coronavirus so that public health officials can track the spread of the disease. So today, we're going to be answering a question that a lot of people have been asking. Can contact tracing be private? If you're new here, I'm Jordan, and I love talking about the ways that we interact with artificial intelligence and algorithms on a day-to-day -day basis. Consider subscribing if you want to learn more. So the simple answer to whether or not contact tracing can be private is yes. Yeah, that's it. That's the end of the video. Everyone can go home now. Time to go watch some Netflix. Okay, obviously that's a bit too easy. The longer answer is that contact tracing can be made private, but whether or not it is private depends on the types of information that you'd like to record, and how that's being executed currently varies by country. In the US, there have been two approaches that lie essentially at the opposite ends of the technological spectrum. Traditional contact tracing and more privacy-preserving algorithmic contact tracing like the Apple-Google collaboration. Interestingly, they rely on the same piece of technology, your phone. Traditional contact tracing has been around for decades, and it's pretty straightforward. Someone arrives at a hospital and tests positive for coronavirus, so they are asked to give a list of names and contact information for anyone they've been in contact with in the last 14 days. Ideally, since most of the world has been shut down for the past few months, that's a pretty short list. Then, real human beings take that list and call everyone on it. They let those people know that they've been in contact with a person who has since tested positive for coronavirus, ask them to self-quarantine for 14 days as well, and ask for a list of the people that they've been in contact with. Contact tracers keep calling and asking and calling and asking until ideally you reach a point where you've contacted all of the people who could have been exposed to the virus. You also now have an idea of where the virus has spread geographically and can keep an eye out for hotspot locations. And while this approach can be effective, it's not particularly fast, relies on a ton of people, and relies on human memory, which is known to be fallible in the best of times. As an aside, if you'd like to learn more about contact tracing or become a contact tracer for your state, Johns Hopkins is offering a free course through Coursera that will give you a certificate for it. Interestingly, traditional contract tracing is also not particularly private. After all, we're collecting names, locations, and information that might be considered protected health information if this were a healthcare system into a centralized database so that we can monitor all of the active cases and where they might be spreading. On the other end of the spectrum is the new privacy-preserving contact tracing method from Google and Apple. This is an API or a set of functions that allows developers to create apps that can use Bluetooth to figure out who a user has been in contact with recently. It's currently only available for use by public health officials. It does this by allowing devices to send out a Bluetooth signal with a unique identifier to everyone within range of the device, and the unique identifier changes every few minutes. It keeps a record of all of the unique identifiers that it's sent. At the same time, the device is listening for other unique identifiers sent out by other devices in the area, and keeps a list of all of the identifiers that it's encountered. At the end of the day, the device uploads its unique identifiers to some centralized database. If a user then tests positive, they can mark that in the app, and all of their unique identifiers will be marked as COVID positive. At that point, any device that has heard that unique identifier in the last 14 days alerts its user that they've been in contact with someone who tested positive for coronavirus, and may ask them to self-quarantine for 14 days or pursue other medical treatment depending on the local regulations. If you'd like a fuller explanation, you should definitely check out Nikki Trace's blog and Grant Sanderson's video on said blog. With this approach, personal privacy is maintained. Even the person who runs the centralized database doesn't know who or where each unique identifier comes from, and contact tracing can be performed a lot faster. However, we do have a lot less information about location. If a bunch of people catch coronavirus in the same area because they've been around the same person, there's no way for us to really know that. In light of this, some health professionals have advocated for the collection of more information, such as location and other personal health information. This would allow for a more epidemiological tracking of the disease because you'd be able to identify hotspot locations. If we were to take a look at a country that's collecting more identifiable location and health information, we might look to a country like China. China probably represents the least private model for contact tracing, where your identity is tied explicitly to all of your information. In fact, when you enter the country, you're given a physical monitor that tracks your location and are contacted by Chinese health officials daily to see if you're symptomatic. 
You also must now prove that you are low risk before entering public spaces like malls and public transportation by scanning a QR code upon exit and entry. However, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see this model deployed at this level in any other country. As we've discussed in other videos, the Chinese surveillance system is so centralized and so comprehensive that in conjunction with other preventative measures such as widespread testing, it's allowed them to deploy this fairly quickly to manage caseless. In fact, as we mentioned early on, contact tracing isn't the only way to manage the spread of a pandemic, so you don't necessarily need to trade in your personal privacy for public health. Policies that support widespread testing, education about self-isolation and when you should seek medical care, and support for the healthcare system have the potential to limit the spread. It's also important to know that contract tracing has a few caveats. First, it requires a decent portion of the population to buy in. In China, that's easy because it's government mandated, but in the US it would be a lot harder because any contact tracing method would likely be a privacy-preserving method that would be opt-in, and it would be up to the user to report whether or not they've had a positive coronavirus test. If you don't have enough people on the app, or not enough people are reporting their positive tests, then contact tracing doesn't help us all that much. Second, contact tracing that involves location is most useful for pandemic management when there are relatively few cases in any one area. After a certain number of cases, you're basically calling everyone, and it doesn't tell you much about the trajectory of the outbreak. Third, even privacy-preserving methods can be hacked, so to speak. A security camera in combination with a device that can record the unique Bluetooth identifiers being emitted in an area can be used to match individuals to their identifiers, and then facial recognition can do the rest. So, can contact tracing be private? Yes, and any option implemented in the US would likely be both private and opt-in. However, I think the more interesting question is whether losing some of that privacy is worth the public health benefits it provides. From an epidemiological perspective, while tracking location and identity are less private, it also allows for precise tracking of the outbreak. Now, this would still require a system that essentially everyone would be required to participate in, which likely couldn't rely on smartphones anyway. Not everyone has them. There are also certainly valid concerns about who these systems might be used or accessed by. Apple and Google have said that only public health officials can use their API and that access to the API will be revoked at the end of the pandemic, but as we discussed earlier, there are opportunities for misuse within the pandemic as well. Personally, I think losing some privacy is worth the public health benefit. I wouldn't support a system as invasive as China's, but given that our phones are already tracking our every movement anyway, I wouldn't mind giving that information up to public health officials. However, I would hope that that information would be used to develop targeted strategies to reduce the impact of the pandemic. Similarly to self-isolation and shutting down the economy, contact tracing cannot solve this problem alone, private or not. And I'd rather not buy into a system that requires me to share my private health information indefinitely, especially since health information isn't as protected in the US as we might think. Now, the one thing that we didn't get into in this video is how the algorithms that underlie contact tracing actually work. If that's something that you're interested in learning more about, I'd highly recommend starting off with a basic algorithms course, and Brilliant offers an amazing algorithm fundamentals course that will take you from writing pseudocode to developing a medical residency matching algorithm and considering the ethics behind it. Personally, algorithms is one of the courses that I skipped when I started getting into programming and machine learning, and has since become one of the most helpful courses I've taken in order to fill in the gaps in my education. So if you're planning to start your computer science education, or if you want to fill in some gaps, Brilliant is the place to go. To get started, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan and sign up for free. In fact, the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. If you like this video, you can let me know by subscribing to my channel over here and smashing that like button down below. You can also check out more coronavirus-related content up here in this playlist. Otherwise, if you'd like to follow me on my PhD journey, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!